Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, wherever you are joining us today virtually. I am Isra Aydın, the Communication Director of Journalists and Writers Foundation. I would like to welcome you all to promoting an independent and pluralistic media virtual discussion on the occasion of WordPress Freedom Day and the 30th anniversary of the Windhoek Declaration. Today, we have several young professionals, distinguished journalists and academics who will discuss promoting and stretching media ethics and the rule of media in democracy. I would like to briefly introduce our moderators, Melanie Formasa. Melanie is a Stonebrook University journalism student. She is the elected secretary of the Society of Professional Journalists, Stonebrook University Campus Chapter. And she is a Stonebrook University School of Communication and Journalism Student Advisory Board. Melanie is the awardee of Stonebrook University Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities Program. She won the Best Isolation Documentary for the 2021 SBU TV Student Short Film Festival. She is the co presider co-host of the GRIT podcast at Stonebrook University. Melanie is a communication and copy editing intern for Friends of the Bay, as well as a project funded by National Geographic. Our second moderator is Erin Alexander Vitris. Erin is a multimedia journalist who graduated from Stonebrook University in 2020. His focus areas are sport, pop culture, and gaming, which are all part of today's bullying industry. He is remiss to work as a podcast sport reporter covering sports such as football, basketball, MMA, and esport. In addition to his academic success at Stonebrook University, Iron has five years of photography and four years, four years of videography experience. Melanie and Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ezra. We're both thrilled to be here today. We will be talking um, about the Vintuk Declaration. And this is the 30th um, anniversary of the Declaration, which the Declaration really relies on media as um, the role it plays in democracy, freedom of the press, freedom of, um, of just voicing opinions. Um, so this declaration is a benchmark for ensuring press freedom around the world. And it began um, at a seminar um, in Windhoek in 1991. So that is where that 30 years comes in. And the ideas exchanged by African journalists there and media professionals acted as a catalyst um, to encourage press freedom and pluralism and independence in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, so this is really what we are celebrating and commemorating. And especially in this current climate of our globe, it's very, very valuable um, to have that freedom of the media and the press. Um, so this declaration also implies an important role for governments to step in and kind of step out in a way um, where states should be proactive um, in protecting journalists and advancing opportunities um, for citizens all across the world um, to express freedom of expression and, um, and their voice. So it is essential um, to to democracy, to the development and maintenance of it, and for economic development. So um, this year's theme for the 30th World Press Freedom Day is information as a public good. So uh, through this panel, we want to um, ask all these dis distinguished journalists their um, perspectives and opinions on advancing transparency and um, empowerment in journalism. So this is of urgent relevance to all countries around the world. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Aaron. Thank you, Melanie. Um, thank you, um, Ezra, for having me here today and being able to speak in front of all of you guys. Um, and then this brings me to the importance of media within democracy, um, which goes back to our right to freedom of speech within the First Amendment. Um, while everyone has the right to say and put out information as they please, that doesn't necessarily mean that information is the truth. Um, that's where the, the importance of trained media comes in, because as gatekeepers of information, it is truly our responsibility to determine the best way to relay information um, that we receive and um, relay it to the public in the most efficient, transparent, and ethical manner possible. 
so citizens are able to make responsible choices um, throughout their day-to-day -day lives. Um, as we saw during the Trump era, when our media is silenced or constantly questioned, um, it can lead to distrust, um, which can also make our jobs harder, but at the end, we do have to work through it um, to avoid the spread of misinformation at the end of the day. Um, that brings us to our first speaker, um, Barbara Selvin. Um, I'll let Melanie take the floor on this one. Thank you, Professor Barbara Selvin, for being with us today. Uh, per Barbara Selvin is a professor at Stony Brook University in New York, and she became the school's first full-time professor in 2007 after helping design what was then the first school of journalism in the SUNY system in New York. Um, she previously taught journalism at Queens College and Hofstra University and directed a high school summer journalism workshop at CUNY for six years. She has led or co-led trips to Kenya, Bangalore and Ecuador with the School of Journalism's Journalism Without Walls program. She is the school's director of internships and careers and the faculty governance lead for journalism. Before she became an ed educator, she was a reporter for Newsday and New York Newsday, uh, where she covered economic development, commercial real estate, housing, um, and healthcare reform, medical research, sexuality for the paper's health and science test. So a lot she has covered. Um, she earned a master's degree at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in 1983, where she received the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship. Her freelance work has been published on partner.org and in Newsday, the New York Times, Columbia Journalism Review, Grassroots Editor, and business and healthcare magazines. Selvin is a member of investigative reporters and editors, journalism and women's symposium, and the International Society of Weekly Newspaper Editors. So Professor Selvin, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So our first question is, um, in order to promote independent and pluralistic media, how can we empower local media and the news institutions to be economically free? from influential companies and interest groups? Well, the money to support journalism has to come from somewhere, whether it's government, advertisers, subscribers, donors, producing journalism is not free. And so whatever the source of the revenue is to support journalistic activity, it's going to come with potential conflicts. It's in an ideal world, there would be no conflicts, but we don't live in that world. So there's always going to be some conflict. Um, perhaps the purest form, the least conflicted form is that is subscribers, uh, because you, those are the people you're writing for anyway, that's, that you should be writing for. If your money is coming from advertisers or donors or um, governments, then there is a pull to, uh, to write coverage that might please or not displease those uh, funders. But subscribers are the people you're writing for anyway, you should always be writing for. So um, the increasing emphasis on subscription revenue to me is a good thing. It's a good, um, it, ethically, it, it gives us the most freedom as journalists. Um, how, how to build that subscriber revenue? Well, we're in an area of, of intense competition for subscription dollars, whether it's um, news organizations or streaming services, everybody has their hand out for us to pay them a monthly subscription, right? And we only have so much money to go around for that kind of content consumption, if you will. Um, but for news organizations, there are increasing numbers of ways to uh, develop that kind of freedom. Um, there are news organizations are experimenting with algorithms that determine the interest level of, of readers and viewers, or let's just say news consumers. Uh, maybe they find what brings people back and they offer a subscription opportunities that are tied to uh, what they see as the most successful ways to bring people into the news organization. Um, some paywalls, uh, in other words, you can't see all the content it, that's behind a paywall unless you subscribe. But um, some of those paywalls are porous. They let people in at different times for different things and moments of crisis, say in natural disasters or during an election when everybody really needs the news right away. Many news organizations drop their paywalls temporarily to give people a sense of uh, 
what the newspaper news organization is providing. During the coronavirus pandemic, especially in the beginning, many news organizations dropped their uh, paywalls for coronavirus coverage because people needed that information to understand what was happening in this unprecedented experience. Uh, some news organizations are trying uh, different approaches to attract subscribers, things like solutions journalism, which focus on responses to social issues rather than writing about problems exclusively. Uh, a kind of a, a more positive framing of a social problem because they're looking at what people are doing and how they're trying to um, uh, succeed in, in, in these challenging areas like hunger, the environment, climate change, housing, racial issues, so on. Um, so, and then there are extras, uh, things that, that draw people in like puzzles, games, cooking. Um, sometimes people come into news organizations th th because they are intrigued by one of those things and then they stay for the, the content, the, the news content. Newsletters, engaging people by uh, creating newsletters for specific interests. All, all these different ways are um, ways of engaging uh, subscribers and building that kind of empowerment that you asked about in your question. Thank you for that. Yeah, that that um, those racial disparities and, and inequality that you mentioned in your answer, I kind of want to jump off of that and ask, based on your expertise on the gender gap in journalism schools and newsrooms, how do you think we can achieve that equality in media coverage? How do we promote fair media coverage of certain races, gender identities, and or ethnicities? Well, that's a very tough question. I can really only speak to the experience here in the United States. That's what I'm familiar with. Um, you know, just looking at gender to start, um, journalism school student bodies in the United States have been majority female for decades, decades since I was in journalism school. And as you mentioned, that was in the 80s. So um, that was a while ago. Uh, and yet the ranks of professional journalists are still dominated by men and the dominance by men increases the higher you go in the leadership ranks. So women are, are very much underrepresented in leadership ranks. And the same is true for um, racial groups, non-white people of non-white backgrounds, um, people with disabilities, all kinds of perspectives, ethnic, racial, religious, uh, physical ability, all kinds of things that you can think of that um, where those perspectives are really important in the newsroom. It's vital that we have people looking for stories that come out of those communities and that aren't necessarily accessible to people who aren't from those communities. We need to shape that coverage with the perspective of people from those communities. So uh, the rep rate of representation is just appalling for um, people of color, for people with disabilities and, and, and Further, once people from these communities get into the newsroom, they're often pigeonholed into covering the areas that are that those identities reflect, even though they might prefer to cover arts or sports or, you know, school boards, whatever, um, you know, city hall. So those are problems endemic to the lack of representation. If you had a more equitable representation of diff people with different identities in the newsroom, there wouldn't be the demand that you always turn to the black reporter to write about Black Lives Matter. Those, so how, how can we promote a better balance of perspectives? You know, the news industry in the United States itself for years has been trying, you know, setting, setting goals and, and then realizing they weren't gonna meet them and pushing the goalposts back another five years, another 10 years. It, it, it's, it's distressing to see how little progress has been made. So I don't, have, I don't have an answer for, oh, this is what we have to do, this will work. Um, but we just must continue to speak out in, on, on these issues, continue to call out um, errors in coverage by writing in comments, writing letters to the editor, um, speaking in, in, in whatever forums are available to discuss these issues joining associations, professional journalism associations for students who are listening. This is really important. I talk about this a lot with my students. It's so important to be, belong to a journalism association, especially if you have an affiliation with an identity that, you, that is underrepresented. That's how you build your voice. There have been um, 
many occasions over the last 10 years where these associations have spoken out on matters of, of interest and news associations, news organizations, the newsmaker, the newsrooms have responded. Challenge the coverage when it's inadequate. Support news organizations that reflect these diverse perspectives and just keep fighting. Absolutely, yes, keep fighting, keep challenging, thank you. And also we welcome questions and comments from the audience. Thank you, Sate Onal, um, for your comment. Yes, definitely, um, countries lose democracy without free and independent ethical media. And also thank you, Aiden and all. Um, hello to Cape Town. <laughs> so one more question, um, Professor Selvin. Do you think privately owned media outlets promote the principles of public interest diversity and pluralism? Well, I was, I, I'm a little unclear on what you mean by privately owned. Do you mean um, as opposed to owned by government like the BBC in the United Kingdom or publicly supported news organizations like National Public Radio here in the United States? Are you contrasting that with private companies or are you talking about the difference between publicly traded companies like um, Compa Comcast, which owns NBC versus uh, hedge phone funds that aren't traded on the stock market? So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by private. Sure, I think, I think we're just kind of getting at um, that monopolized sense of huge publicly owned media outlets versus privately owned. So maybe for instance, the states, well, no, I don't know if the statesman at Stony Brook is publicly or privately owned. Yeah, that's but, a tough one. Yeah, that is a tough one. But just, I don't know, just kind of that um, that antithesis between like the private sector versus the public and how that affects the principles of diversity and pluralism. Well, I honestly don't think that ownership necessarily correlates with public interest, uh, diversity and pluralism. I think it's more case by case. Um, in, in general terms, I think that um, news organizations that are owned by hedge funds are generally doing a bad job of presenting a balanced uh, or even sufficient, minimally sufficient news product to their audiences in many cases. So um, I think publicly supported news organizations like public television and radio in the United States have a, a somewhat better track record, but not perfect. So I don't think that the form of ownership is the... Uh, deciding factor in um, the quality in terms of uh, diversity, public interest and pluralism. I think it has m more to do with a top-down sense of mission, whoever the owner is. And, and then the owner has to support that sense of mission. Right, right. So that mission, that purpose, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Selvin. Now we're gonna go on to the next panelist. Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, um, Professor Selvin. Um, our second speaker will be Yazid Kamaldin, who is a freelance journalist and documentary filmmaker from Cape Town, South Africa. His focus is so on social justice and human rights issues, while also doing some reporting on religion and culture. His short films include Imagina na Copa, um, made in 2014, which was filmed in Brazil, um, Inside Cobain, 2015, filmed in Turkey and Syria, and This Was Our Home, filmed in 2017 in Cape, in Cape Town. He was based in Yemen, where he reported on the Arab Spring in 2011. He has also reported from the Gaza Strip in 2009 and been on previous journalism scholarships, notably a um, Duke Media Fellow at Duke University in North Carolina in, in the US. He was the production manager of the Emmy award-winning documentary, Film Minor Shot Down in 2014. His work has been published in numerous newspapers and magazines. Um, Yazid? Is Yazid here? I'm here. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. my, uh, thank you for being here, Yazid. Uh, my first question um, to kick things off would be, um, how do you frankly, frankly combat the challenging situations that, that you have encountered covering human rights violations and social justice issues in order to live um, life with a peace of mind? Because I've seen you've been um, basically all over the world. So um, how do you combat that? So, um, yeah, I'm listening to your question and it says, how do you combat? What's the last part? How do you combat? Um, how do you combat the challenging combat situations? Combat the challenging situations. Yeah. Okay, I've mm -hmm. got it open on email as well. So look, you can't exactly combat the challenging situation half the time. 
but you can be well prepared for the challenging situation. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you are going into a conflict zone, whether it's in Yemen, in Syria, the Gaza Strip, or in Cape Town, or wherever it may be, um, you just have to be prepared. And combat zones or conflict zones, as it says, you are going to be walking into a conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, the challenging situations, that's how do you frankly combat the challenging situations? That's where my mind is focusing, especially when you are looking at human rights violations. So look, if you are going into a, um, a conflict zone with a challenging situation, you have to be prepared. You need to know your local people. You need to have your local contacts. You can't just walk into a situation with your camera, your notebook, mm -hmm. and your, um, you know, your voice recorder and expect to walk out of there with tons and tons of brilliantly well-researched uh, and written stories. You just have to be prepared for like mm -hmm. the worst, I guess, half the time. Um, for example, when we were in Syria, we had just a few days there and we had to work nonstop capturing as much stories and footage and stuff same with the gaza strip you just have to be prepared keep your your headlights on look out for the story and look out for the conflict save your life get out with it alive to tell the story thank you um could you go more in depth into that um possibly a situation within syria um give us more insight um how you went about the situation um when when you face adversity so I went to Kobane, which is on the border of Turkey. And um, so Kobane is an area that had faced a lot of um, bloodshed, actually, because the Islamic State or ISIS had been fighting with the uh, Syrians, particularly the Kurdish Syrians based in Kobane, because the Islamic State wanted to expand their territory. And a conflict had ensued because the locals, of course, did not want to submit to Islamic State. And um, following that protracted uh, battle, the US and other governments then had uh, attacked ISIS, the Islamic State, via airstrikes. So by the time we got into Kobani, it was a, a, a place that was really, um, it was a shattered environment. The buildings were broken. There were bricks all over the place. Um, I've got my documentary film Inside Kobani on YouTube, actually. So if anybody wants to watch it, it's on YouTube. It's called Inside Kobani. And you'll see the footage of what we saw. And when you get into that situation, you're, you're kind of like going on almost emergency mode or autopilot because you know you have a limited time to get the story and to understand the impact of the conflict on people. So some Syrians had moved back to Kobani and I just had to go around interviewing as many people, as many eyewitnesses. There weren't that many, but there were enough to interview because it was still, it was still basically just a, like all the buildings were down, you know, because mm -hmm. there were like rockets and all kinds of things damaging the, the place. So for us, it was just the few people who were there as journalists. We just wanted to interview people, talk about what they'd seen. I mean, at some point, I actually also saw like a body of an ISIS fighter amidst the rubble, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and the conflict between ISIS and the Kurdish military was still going on an hour, about an hour from where we were. So we were at a makeshift hospital and they were bringing people back who were injured, you know, on the front line. And really the situation was just, Look at the humanitarian impact. That's me. That's that's what I always look at. I always look at how is conflict impacting on people so that we can understand, you know, like exactly what's going on through the experience of people as opposed to just writing about the bodies and the, the politics. I, I, I like to focus on the people and how impact, how conflict impacts on people and human life. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that insight um, with us. Um, that brings me to my second question. Um, we actually discussed this um, in the panel discussion we had before, um, and it's in regards to citizen journalism. Um, do you think citizen journalism is more reliable than the established media? If so, why? So for me, the question about citizen journalism is less around whether it's reliable, because for me, reliable is kind of... A little bit subjective you know mm -hmm. it's like I can read information 
by a citizen journalist and they could be on the scene and they've looked at a situation and they've documented the situation and they've shared that information with me on social media via, you know, Facebook or Twitter or whichever social media they are. On. And I would get the information. And based mm -hmm. on the fact that I got the information from that person who was there on the scene, you know, I could say, cool, that was a reliable source of information in the sense that they were there. Now, the question for me is more about ethics than reliability. Mm -hmm. So when I compare the citizen journalism with what I look at as professional journalism, I'm interested also in the source. Yeah, I'm interested mm -hmm. in who is giving me that information. And I believe that very often journalists in the professional environment, their work goes through certain checks and checks and balances in a newsroom mm -hmm. or in an organization. So I feel that they can bring more perspective if they do the research properly. I'm not saying it's everyone. You know, they could even get two sides of the story or more than one side of the story. So I feel that for me would be more ethical when it comes to journalism. So for example, citizen journalists, they are often embedded in a situation or in an environment. They're there with their cameras and their phones. Very often they are linked somehow to the communities that they are reporting on. And for me, when I want journalism, I want someone who is a bit removed from the story. I don't want someone who is who has a vested interest in, in the story. I want someone who's also able to take a step back look at it critically, get other voices, get other opinions, formulate a complete narrative as opposed to just being a primary source of information. Obviously, it works best if the journalist is the primary source of information. That's not the, the part that, I'm, that I have a problem with when it comes to citizen journalism. For me, it's about how ethical is the reporter, how ethical is the journalist in relaying the information. So yeah, for me, it comes down to ethics. Um, so then um, I have a follow-up question with that. Um, how, how do you think the, this new era of social media um, has impacted um, the idea of citizen journalism? Citizen journalism has been immensely empowered by social media. Mm -hmm. um, I take my hat off to a lot of the citizen journalists and what they are doing. Very often they are the first on the scene. They're the first people to tell us about what's happening in the world. They tweet, they put it out on Facebook Live, et cetera. I mean, I've used social media as a journalist as well. I mean, I've done live uh, broadcasts from, let's say, an event here in Cape Town, um, whether it's a protest or whatever else. And I, the reason I did it was because I loved the, um, the sort of like on-the-spot immediacy of it, you know, and also mm -hmm. video, conveys, video conveys so much more than just text because with video you feel – connected to the experience through seeing the visuals and hearing the audio. Now, social media has been very good for citizen journalism, that's for sure. And I think that if we were to enhance citizen journalism, I think it could be, well, the way that we could enhance citizen journalism is to get more people trained in ethics. For example, mm -hmm. you're a citizen journalist, you're out in the field, are you aware of the journalism guidelines, for example, on the identities that you expose of people, the way you show children? You know, like sometimes you see things being reported just like people's identities are exposed, children's faces are exposed, you know, and these are the kinds of things that you won't, it just won't pass at a credible news organization. It won't pass for credible journalism within a news organization. So, yeah, that's my take on it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and for my final question, um, question number three, according to the World Press Freedom Index in 2021, there is a dramatic deterioration in people's access to information and an increase in obstacles to news coverage. The coronavirus pandemic has been used as grounds to block journalists' access to information sources and reporting in the field. Do you think the access to information um, will be restored when the pandemic is over? Um, where does citizen journalism stand in this? So during the pandemic, um, I was reporting on the lockdown, particularly the hard lockdown here in South Africa. I got a permit, a journalist permit. I could move around. 
I went to various press briefings. The president of South Africa was in the, traveling in my city. We followed them. We looked at what they were doing. The health minister was there, et cetera. You know, I was doing a radio show. I was doing TV journalism and I was doing some reporting for a newspaper. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, during the lockdown, during COVID, we found that everything was very unilateral. Our government was making decisions. There was hardly any consultation with the public. It was just like, okay, it was a state of emergency, obviously. So, you know, there were certain strict enforcements of the law that was taking place, but there was no real sort of like, um, it was just a one way. There was no kind of like feedback loop to the government about things. People would just like vent on social media and so on. So we definitely felt a bit like, you know, these decisions that the government was making about public money, which is our money, decisions they were making about how we, how and where we could move and what we could do. Of course, it was all done in the name and the interest of the public's health, but not all of it was done really, um, you know, ethically. Afterwards, we found there was so much corruption, there was money being stolen, etc. So people could like get away with more if you like. But the fact of the matter is that people with power are always going to try and hide what they're doing. And it's not always just people with power, it's just anybody, people who are doing something which is unethical or which is criminal or which is not following the law, they're always going to want to try and hide that, right? So mm -hmm. even before the pandemic, there were so many people, there were so many organizations, even governments trying to prevent the media from accessing information. And that's not going to change after the pandemic. They are still going to be the same kind of people trying to prevent journalists from accessing information. I mean, Look at all the big organizations. They all have communications managers. They all have spokespersons. Governments even have spokespersons. Everybody wants to control how they are perceived. Everybody needs to hide something, okay? Or they want to sell you something. And the way they do that is via the media. The way they do that do it is via social media. So we shouldn't think after the pandemic that things are going to change because so many, many years, journalists have been under threat. And that will still be the case. Um, awesome. Um, thank you so much, Yazid, um, for your for your wonderful insight on these questions. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Melanie, um, and she will introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Aaron. We have Dr. Joseph Akumu here today, and we will be asking some questions um, from him. And he is um, a diligent and organized professional, drawing upon 10 years of experience in teaching, research and administration across Kenyan universities. He's a graduate of the University of Leuven in Belgium, and he has been responsible for the development and review of academic programs since 2016 at the Center for Social Justice and Ethics, uh, the Catholic University of Eastern Africa in Nairobi, where he also successfully initiated the online journal of social encounters, which he co-edits. He introduced and taught business ethics course to the Doctor of Business Administration, which was adopted as a core course in 2014. He has also taught courses in philosophy and he is a member of Amnesty International Kenya, CIPE and GlobeEthics.net among others. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So the first question we have for you is what does your commitment to a more just and democ democratic society look like in reality? Thank you, Melanie, for that question. Um, normally, it, you can hear me well, I hope. Right, so it might look like a huge thing, but it's first and foremost is the very basic things within our reach that an individual can do successfully and influence positively the neighbor or the people next to them. Let me give a very big, quick example. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused a lot of havoc in society. As a way to deal with its effects, we've been advised by World Health Organization to observe certain protocols a just and fair-minded individuals would simply do that. So justice does not need you know, grand projects. 
you need to think, or one needs to think in terms of respecting the next person. So if one keeps social distance as recommended, if one wears their mask as recommended and the other protocols, then that is a way towards achieving a more social and democratic society. Because democratic societies and social justice are based on certain rules. The rule of law is an important one. So observing the law of the land or observing municipal law is one of those things that one can do to bring about a more just, a more fair, a more democratic society. So this is what I mean when I say that I am committed to achieving a more just and fair society. But I also mean by that acting ethically. That means not engaging in ways that might harm others. That means also not engaging or allowing any form of corruption when I am aware that there is corruption going on here or taking bribes or giving bribes or soliciting for them in any way. They are guys who do not care. A certain research was done in Kenya in 2016 among young people, college students, and over 65% of them said that they would take bribes, they would give bribes as long as they would not be caught. So if they are not caught, it is okay. But in case they're caught, then giving bribes is bad. Now that is a lot of people and that is young people. And we are talking about the millennial generation. Now that kind of attitude does not help one achieve a just society. Because when you are giving bribe or when you are accepting bribe or when you're engaged in, in corruption, you're denying another one a chance to realize themselves, to realize their objectives. So the rule of law, that what I said, uh, doing what one can do within their means, that one also, uh, avoiding corruption, that what I said, but also uh, <coughs> we, we <coughs> if each one, and if this is because I come from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa and the Center for Social Justice and Ethics, and in one of the fundamental aspects of the Center for Social Justice and Ethics is the idea of seeing each and every individual as the image of God. One way of looking at that is from the perspective of equal rights. But another one is each, if each and everyone is the image of God, irrespective of culture, race, gender, you know, <clears throat> and other things, then there are ways to act towards others and there are ways to not to do that. And these are basically what I consider, you know, ways that can help achieve a, social, a socially just world. But allow me also to say that individually, one may not achieve much. And that is the idea therefore of joining organizations or groups whose agenda, whose aspirations, whose work, conform or you know, agree with what you are looking for. So for me, Amnesty International is helpful in that way in terms of realizing human rights. SIP is helpful in that way in terms of fighting corruption as well as globetics.net. Thank you for that. I, I can't believe that so many people would be willing to take bribes <laughs> if they aren't caught. I'm certainly not one of them, but yes, likening that to our, our society. And yes, I absolutely agree with what you've said. Thank you for that. My next question for you is, given your background, how do you evaluate the impact of the media in achievement of sustainable peace? One a way to look at that is to uh, look at the Jakarta Declaration of 2017, which is part of what we a concern with today. And that speaks to SDGs, obviously. And, and therefore, in terms of achieving, you know, sustainable development, the media is a crucial player in terms of disseminating information, the right information, 
communicating, sharing ideas, or creating platforms through which proper, you know, I mean, important information or relevant information can be shared. Or platforms like, you know, <coughs> this, through which we can simply share ideas. So the role of the media is simply unavoidable. It is, it is inevitable. The media is perhaps one of the most important, allow me to use the word tools that we can use towards achieving these goals. It is terribly important in that sense. Absolutely. You look at the world through a PhD. So in philosophy, mind you. So how does this, how does your knowledge in philosophy change your perspective on journalism and press freedom? Well, one is, as I've said, journalism, the media, um, digital technology, allow me to add, is extremely important in human lives. Today, as we are aware, social media is simply ubiquitous. And, and so there is the, the, the prevalence is such that you cannot avoid but use or participate in platforms that, you know, in, in these platforms, let me say. And, and therefore, <clears throat> in terms of what I have studied, in terms of uh, my education, in terms of business ethics, and in terms of everything else that goes around the media. I think that, did I get the question right? Sorry, <laughs> I'm going too far. No, no, you're, you're on the right track. That, that's philosophy for you, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm just so, wondering. So a philosopher's like, take will, first of all, look at those positive elements. So a philosopher's take will be that, uh, you know, the media can indeed influence the manner in which the philosopher philosophizes. Because after all, philosophizing has to be communicated in certain ways that make sense. And that is the work of the media. But the philosopher also influences the media in terms of raising questions about meanings, about the impact of media in or to society. And those questions are sometimes looked at from the perspective of content or of method, or if you like, ethics. Content might simply be ways in which the media you know, relays information. From a philosophical perspective, one would want that you know, certain information is passed in ways that are consistent with the values of objectivity, if you want also neutrality, or in ways that are consistent with, you know, what is required by the media in terms of its own code of conduct. But over and above that, the ethical values and norms are, are very important. In terms of content, you might, the media might learn from, for instance, uh, you know, uh, philosophy of language, which is so concerned uh, with the, you know, the meaning of what is expressed, the content of what is expressed, and the idea of cogency, the logical, you know, you know, content of that, so that we do not, as people in the media, not simply write but write in ways that make sense, write in ways that help improve society. Because in fact, the media as valuable as it is can also destroy society. Certain conflicts in the world are said to have been fueled by the media. There is a claim that the Rwandese genocide was, uh, I do not have proof of that, but there is that claim. But there are also ways in which we can express, you know, certain things that may harm rather than promote the dignity of the human person. So I look at it from that perspective. Thank you, Dr. Akumu. Thank you yes. very much for that. Also, I'd like to thank Amat Kaglian for uh, congratulating us for this program. I'm also thrilled to be here and huddled masses. Um, definitely 
um, it's very important to have a free media. Thank you for that. So now I'm going to hand it over to Aaron for our next. Can I just panel. ask one question? Absolutely, please. What was was is that it? No, we have we have one more panelist, and then we're going to just all collaborate and and ask more questions to everyone. Ah, okay, okay. If we have time. <laughs> we should though. We should have time. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Joe. Um, our fourth speaker um, that I'll be introducing is Nicole Castro. Um, she's a freelance journalist, young professional um, from the Dominican Republic. Nicole is the Director of Communications and International Multi-Service Educational Entertainment Company, co-host at a Spanish international radio show, and serves as an editorial volunteer writer at the UMV Regional Office of Latin America and the Caribbean. She holds a bachelor's degree in journalism, a graduate certificate in international law and diplomacy, and a master's in international relations. In the past, Nicole has worked with various news and nonprofit organizations as a journalist, editorial assistant, staff writer, and assistant to the director of sales, marketing, and business. Nicole has a curious soul that often takes her to places that allow her to serve her community and shed light on stories that are often untold or overlooked. Um, thank you for being here, Nicole. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, so just to kick things off, my first question to you would be, in your country, to what extent can journalists freely do their jobs? Um, can professional groups freely promote and protect journalists' rights and interests? Sure. Uh, journalists are free to pursue any topic or story, mm -hmm. but not without retaliation. There are many cases where journalists, journalists who are strong and continuous critic of the government, they suffer the consequences. And just as Jesse said, people that are in power or are doing something criminal or want to hide something. And one of the cases uh, that happened, it was a very famous case in 2007, was the case of the journalist called Luis Manuel Media Perez. He was a strong critic of local authorities and he was gone down mid broadcast along with his producer. Uh, as for can journalist group freely promote and protect journalists right and interests, they can promote has to protect. It really depends on the resources and how much, how strong of a hold does the government have at the moment? Um. Are you usually expecting retaliation for any work you do? Um, is this something that kind of like lingers in the back of your mind? Um, how do you mentally prepare yourself for that? Uh, yes, I, I think that as a journalist, you always have that little voice that tells you, okay, you know, this topic is a little bit dangerous, can it backfire? But mm -hmm. I feel that it's our duty and our job to mm -hmm. know how to report the story without mm -hmm putting ourselves in as much danger as possible. Okay. Um, my second question is, some journalism students are debating on um, whether they should pursue a master's degree or if they should just head um, straight out into the world and start reporting. Um, what advice can you give um, based on your own graduate studies um, to younger journalists considering getting a master's? Yes, uh, I believe that as a journalist, you need to do anything in your power to be informed and not knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. whether that is pursuing a master's degree in the field of your choice or researching a topic. There is something that you can only learn in the field. You can only learn chasing the stories, interviewing the sources, but there's, a, there's also something that you can only learn pursuing a master's degree. When I pursued my master's degree was because I really wanted to comprehend not only from the outside point of view, but also from the inside uh, international affairs. So that really depends on the person and the means and the willingness they have. Um, do you feel that gave you the, like, the leverage to take it to the next level, you know, make that next step once you got your master's? Personally, yes, but I do believe that that is not a requirement. I believe okay. that there is a lot of journalists that can go up that step or can go even higher uh, without pursuing a master's degree. Um, and then my third question, um, you have mentioned before that being a journalist, um, and I quote, I see myself as an international journalist covering and uncovering human rights violations, international relations, and politics. Journalists who are reporting human rights violations need greater protection. 
um, restrictions on media and press freedom, freedom and impunity around violations against journalists, stigmatization, violence and self-censorship and media workers defending human rights. What kind of chilling effects do these violations have on your work? Yes, uh, I would say it's a, it's a journey of self-discovery in the sense mm. that in one hand you are constantly prioritizing and making sacrifices. Sometimes when you cover a topic or chasing a story, it puts you to, in danger, but it can also put your loved ones in danger. Sometimes retaliation is not only to yourself, it can be to your family. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, you just have that need that you feel that duty of chasing the truth, uncovering injustice, reporting corruption. Mm -hmm. So what effect it has on my work, I will say, it's a sense of motivation. Sometimes mm -hmm. when you're chasing a story, the harder it is to get the truth, the more convinced you are that you should be chasing that story. But mm -hmm. at the same time, when you face all these challenges, it, you can find yourself self-censoring your own work. And I think that is a very fine line that uh, we constantly have to be facing in the sense sometimes you want to say something, but you might limit yourself. Mm -hmm. You might want to cover a topic, but you think twice and so on. Um, has that happened to you before? Um, have you held yourself back out of fear of retaliation? Maybe you didn't put something out that, you know, you look back and like, hey, maybe I should have put that out. Um, has that ever happened? Uh, yes, yes. Um, and that's why I'm saying uh, out of experience, sometimes when you write mm -hmm. a story, you self-censor yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, would you be able to like dive into maybe what the story was or? or <laughs> uh Yes, uh, it was it was a short story. It was a freelance work, and it was about some human rights violations that are being overlooked in my country. Something that's mm. called um, Zona Franca. So that will be a factory, and the way that uh, workers sometimes are treated or mistreated in the working conditions. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Nicole, for your insight um, and your wonderful you. answers. Um, I'm going to pass the that, um That was actually our last speaker. So that would wrap up um, our introductions to speakers. Um, we will now open the floor up um, to anybody else that has questions, the audience, um, and I'll pass it back on to Melanie. Yes. Th thank you, Aaron. So yes, of course, if, if the audience has questions, please drop it in the chat and we will do our best to answer them. Um, to go back to Professor Selvin, um, I have a question for you, and probably a lot of other students are wondering your, your take on this as well. Um, do you think that unpaid internships um, are, are justified and, and fair to the student? Absolutely not. I've long <laughs> been... <laughs> I've long been an opponent of uh, a vocal opponent of unpaid internships. Um, in fact, I was working on that very issue earlier this morning uh, in, as part of something I was doing with the internship and career committee at our school. Um, I, yes, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, news organizations, many are, are suffering more now than ever uh, to, to sustain their organizations financially. But don't balance your books on the backs of students. We were talking earlier about uh, representation of different groups in, in newsrooms. And a really good way to keep that from happening is to require that students take unpaid internships because then you're limiting uh, the availability, the practical availability of those internships to a very small segment of society. Those who, whose parents can afford, students whose parents can afford to support them, who don't have to work to pay their next semester's tuition uh, and sometimes pay for the privilege of not working by having to pay for credits to take an internship, a summer internship usually. So I think uh, unpaid internships are, are not only unfair, but work against the, um, the, the pressing need for news organizations to diversify the people in their newsrooms. Uh, it's a matter of social justice. Um, you know, there, there may be individual situations, a poorly capitalized startup say that, that just don't have a spare penny, but I find it very hard to justify under any circumstance 
um, having students work for free. Especially in the context of, of this 30th anniversary of, of press freedom and, and trying yes. to advance social justice. Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, Aaron, do you have anything to, to ask Professor Selvin? Um, actually, I do. Um, I had the pleasure of being involved in one of your business classes, um, and you actually um, dived into blockchain um, pretty early <laughs> on. And yes, yeah, so um, now with the um, the craze of cryptocurrencies becoming a thing and also NFTs, um, non-fungible non trades, um, do you think maybe newsrooms or, you know, the journalist side of it um, might be able to take advantage of, of some of these um, nuances that are, are popping up, um, more specifically the cryptocurrencies? Do you think um, there'll be able like a crossover sometime? Well, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> The semester that you were in my class, which is a class on how the, uh, the digital age has changed the economics of, of news production um, and, and how, how news organizations need to get back in the game financially mm -hmm. with the demise mm -hmm. of advertising. Um, it looked, there, were, there was an experiment going on with blockchain at that time uh, mm -hmm. in trying to create a new set of newsrooms that were funded by blockchain and it totally failed. That whole effort completely flopped. Wow. Um, but the new, the non-fungible tokens and the, the enormous amounts of money that are being paid for these things, which I find very difficult to wrap my head around. I mean, blockchain itself is very confusing, which is why <laughs> I made a face when you brought it up. <laughs> but uh Possibly. I know that a few weeks ago, there was a reporter for the New York Times who sold his column as a, an NFT yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and got some revenue yeah. from that. So, you know, look, people will buy pet rocks. Uh, maybe they'll buy NFTs and support the newsroom that way. Mm -hmm. Could be. I mean, I, I, I put nothing past the you know, human capacity for mm -hmm bizarre economic behavior so yeah. it's possible okay. but i don't see that as a uh, a long-term or a systemic solution it seems oh, more like a kind okay. of a one-off uh, maybe i'm wrong mm -hmm. time will tell yep thank you professor selvin i hope that answered your question aaron i think it did um we have a question from the the chat um and anyone on this panel is open to answering it um Katina Litt asks, has the chilling effect of the last American administration on journalists in calling news fake news and openly insulting journalists being reversed internationally? And I can put that um, in case you'd like to read it. Anyone again can, can answer. Uh, Yazid, were you going to say something? Um, I, I, I don't haven't, I can't speak internationally in the United States. Um, I think it's died down a little bit with, uh, with the uh, constant tweeting that was going on in the previous administration having been silenced. I think that there's uh, uh, somewhat less uh, attempts to shout down journalists than there were a few months ago. And for the preceding few years, I, I don't know about internationally. I mean, the, the thing about using the term fake news to discredit journalism, and of course, the seekers of the truth, dare I say, um, it's such an age old trick in a new disguise or a new world, you know. Um, there have always been attempts to discredit journalists and journalism in the face of, or rather, instead of facing the truth, right? So um, this isn't something that's going to go away. Um, the question is specifically related to the American administration, and we also saw a lot of the former president making use of the words fake news. Um, Frankenstein, you know, like he's not new in the game. He was a new game. Some government and politicians have been doing many, many years. And that is also in countries, governments aim and succeed in many places to build the media, to own the media, to distribute the media, you know? So um, 
has there been is it been reversed internationally? I think we are maybe seeing less of one particular person in the media using the word fake news to discredit journalism and journalists, but it's certainly not going to go away, not for as long as we in the media seek the truth. Thank you, Yusid. You, I think you were breaking up a little bit. I hope everyone could hear um, on the YouTube side. Um, I guess, Aaron, do you want to do you want to ask another question, or or uh, we could jump off something else? Um, we can we yeah we can bounce off something else. Okay, so um, I have a question, and again, anyone can answer. How does a journalist promote press feed freedom without um, unbiased, neutral reporting? So we are all human. We all have intrinsic biases. How do we try and shy away from them or discard them even and just report neutrally. Nicole, maybe you would like to answer that? Yes, uh, I believe that is a hard one. As journalists, I think we are biased in a bit. But I think that the best way is always emphasizing the importance of journalism and the importance of uh, freedom of the press, because I think it's the only way that we could truly have a democracy, we could truly be balanced and we could truly be informed. Thank you for that. Uh, yes. I, I think, it, it, you know, it's the sort of the pat answer to that question is, well, we as journalists should be aware of our biases and then work to, you know, counteract them. But that's not really so easy. Um, it was brought home to me recently when uh, a journalist I really admire um, uh, and, and who is a very strong proponent of, of represent equal representation and equity and diversity and inclusion um, dismissed a concern that I had. And, and I, I felt that this journalist was not aware of the bias that was implicit in his um, dismissal of the concerns. and. Um, I don't want to say anything more about about that, you know, in particular. But um, so, even with the best of intentions, it's hard for us as individuals to always recognize where our biases come from. When you can't, when it, when something is brought to your attention, then you know it, it's very easy to to get defensive or to dig your heels in on a bias. But as with listening to to other people, to listen to people when you're reporting on them and you're listening to your sources and to what, right, really trying to hear what they have to say and where they're coming from. You try to, to separate the, uh, the signal from the noise in, in criticism also, and to see where you might be missing a perspective, uh, where you might not even realize that you were um, making assumptions uh, or that these assumptions are very deeply embedded in how you see the world. Um, it, it, so tr try to be open to one's own human weaknesses, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Right, just being aware is the first step to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being aware that, you're, you're, you're can, that you, you too can fall prey to bias. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm just glad, um, I, I agree with you. Yes, I agree with Professor Selvin. I mean, all human beings are biased. So that's a fact. So the first step to, you know, neutralizing uh, our prejudice and bias is, is accepting that we are. And, and, and because we know we are, we act in ways towards dealing with that, in ways towards maybe reducing our bias to, to bare minimum. But that is just one, every, you know, group, every media group have a code of conduct. And it is important always to, to have that with you all the time and to try to observe them as much as possible. And then the, the, the other part is to think of the implication of what you write, the implication of what you say to the society, to the people around you, to others, because you can cause violence just because of a sentence. You can create chaos for other you know, unforeseen consequences just because of what you wrote or posted or stuff like that. 
So whereas we are all prejudiced, whereas we are all biased, it's always important to try to observe the rules of the game as much as possible. It doesn't mean that we want to make mistakes, that we want to go wrong, but it is important that we are aware so that you know you, you can you know, deal with it. Definitely, thank you. Yes, uh, Mehmet Kilik has a question. Um, Turkey is one of the worst jailers of journalists in the world, according to Press Freedom Index. Many journalists had to flee the country. How can international media help journalists in exile? Maybe Yazid, you'd be interested in answering this one. And if you break up, perhaps stop your video and maybe we'll just listen instead. You can try speaking. Okay, well, just, yeah, just indicate to me if it's breaking up. Is the volume okay or should I stop the video? Try stopping should the video. Should I continue speaking? How that works. Mm -hmm. Try stopping okay, the video. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Is this good? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, I've been to Turkey a number of times, and I've also met journalists who have faced um, various government uh, sort of, um, if I can say, uh, gagging, you know, the government trying to silence them, etc. And I, I'm aware through meeting journalists, the challenges that they face in Turkey. Now, we do, as a profession, have a number of organizations that intend to help journalism and ensure that journalism, rather journalists and ensure that journalism, journalism is free. Um, organizations such as the Committee to, for, to Protect Journalists, and there are also other organizations on a regional level in different regions of the world. And I feel like the more we speak out against the uh, silencing of the media and journalists, the more we need to ensure that we gain public support and sympathy for the situation of journalists. And it's not always just governments, you know. Uh, sometimes it's political groups, uh, factions, all kinds of other criminal syndicates, etc., that try and silence journalists. And, you know, people, like we heard earlier, want to use the words fake news and they want to do all kinds of uh, sort of they want to take various actions against journalists to make it seem like we are not doing our job and of course i'm not going to say that everybody is doing their job ethically and that everybody is on the same page when it comes to what we should be doing professionally but to a large extent i think journalists who are called to this profession and do they are following this and they are following the uh the guidelines and principles and tools of what it means to be a journalist and uh, when it comes to people who want to silence us and stop us from doing our work, we need, to, we need to fight back. We need to use our pens, right? We need to write about this. We need to blog about this, tweet about it, talk about it. Because the more that we have public sympathy and awareness, the more there will be a demand for a free press. And um, it, it's about lobbying and making sure that we protect journalists. Um, it's ongoing work, of course, because just as much as we want free, free journalism and uh, you know access to information, there are always going to be people who want to stop us and prevent us from getting that. So uh, this is why we have organizations, international organizations that are doing sterling work and then we should get behind them as well and I guess become more connected because you know what, what happens in in the East affects what happens in the West. If journalists can be killed and, and silenced in one part of the world, soon it will seem normal in, uh, in another part of the world. So we, we really need to stand against this wherever we are because we do know the value of journalism in, in our societies. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, um, I um, think that... Yeah, actually, please. yeah, I actually have a question for Yazid. Um, yeah. um, through your bio, um, it lists a lengthy amount of work you've done within the production side and film side. Um, when you decided to become a journalist, was it always your intention to dive in into creating your own films? Can you 
can I just can you hear me? Uh, I can, can hear you, hear you a little. A little bit. Okay, let me the video again. It would probably be yeah. Turn off your video. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm gonna the first thing I'm gonna say to you is that, dude, you are such a journalist. You know that. <laughs> I'm I like mean, listening to this guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm like listening to. Yeah, yeah, you're doing it. You're doing it. I'm listening to this guy's questions, and then he's doing follow-up questions, and he's coming from different angles, and I'm like, okay, I see your game. I know your game. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always wanted to make films. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always been part of my plan. I mean, I studied film as well as journalism so yeah it's always been part of the plan and i'm super super glad that i'm now making films as well um where do you think film like where does film has it have its place in the journalism world though um because they're always they always seem to be intertwined in a sense um where do you think um films places well film Film has always been a super powerful medium, and mm -hmm. especially we're seeing it now more with, with more and more with video on social media. The immediacy of video, the impact of being able to communicate with an audience through the visual and the audio and on an emotional level. Um, so yeah, that's why video is so powerful, and film in itself is such a powerful communication tool as well. Um, so yeah, I am loving working in film and with video. Did awesome. you so, see I have a yeah. question. Uh, now I have a follow-up question for that. How has um, like being the production manager of that film impacted your writing style? And because people don't have a very long attention span, we know that. And I'm wondering how your knowledge in the film industry has impacted your your reporting, if at all? Well, I would say it was actually the other way around. Because remember with journalism, and particularly with daily newspaper journalism, where I've worked, and also at weekend newspapers, you have X amount of space to write a very complex story. You can spend half a day to a, maybe up to seven, eight hours Sometimes at an event or at a story, you get back to the office, the editor says, oh, something else happened. We only need 300 words. And then you're like, how am I going to fit in to 300 words everything that I think is important from today? So if anything, journalism is such a, the actual writing part of journalism, the, when we begin to craft, when we begin to sit down at our desk and use our words to relate these very complex ideas or experiences, that really is the source of it all. And that helps you actually become a better film editor or even a better storyteller teller in whatever medium you're going to be working in because you need to condense those thoughts and those many words and all those conflicting ideas and views and opinions into 300 words so it can fit onto page five at the bottom somewhere, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's the labor of love. Um, and that is actually the thing that helps more in terms of telling stories in other formats, such as films. You know, film, of course, is enhanced by the, by the visual and the audio. But at the end of the day, you're still telling a story. And if you can put that story down onto, let's say, paper, not in text form necessarily, but whether it's through a storyboard or whether it's through just putting it down in some form, you are doing so much of the work before you even start editing, you know? So it just, it can help you actually enhance your filmmaking. Definitely, thank you, thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Akumu. Um, you teach business ethics um, at the Doctor of Business Administration program. And I'm wondering what, what was the primary, you know, if you had to just choose like one theme from that program, what would it be? And does it relate to journalism? Thank you for that question. It would be sustainability. And that is that in relation to corruption, 
or an ethical conduct, if you want, that unethical businesses do not survive and are not sustainable, which implies that they bring about adverse effects to the economy and the people. Employees lose their jobs, the businesses collapse as a consequence of misconduct of individuals. So therefore, if a business is to be sustainable, it has to be ethical. Not only that, but also obeying the law as a requirement, including therefore paying taxes. There are businesses in my country, huge and profitable businesses that we read in the media do not pay taxes or avoid paying taxes and they get away with it. So it has always been for me the idea of sustainability and, and I wrap that around the, the key components of any business, marketing, finance and human resource management. It is always for me about sustainability of the business and the implication of that to society. Excellent, thank you. Sustainability, very important. Well, Aaron, um, I think that's it for today. Do you have anything to add? Um, no, um, just thank you to all the speakers. Um, thank you to Ezra um, for, having, for having me here and um, for being here as well. Yes, thank you all for being here, for celebrating the 30th anniversary of Press thank Freedom you. Day. And, um, and thank you to our viewers and, and everyone who, who hopefully got something from this.